Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables. Today is our last CEO Roundtable of the day. Uh, we're excited that you're here joining us, both as our guests in the room of Telecom Exchange NYC, as well as for our viewers on Periscope, as well as on JSA TV. We'd also like to thank our Wi-Fi sponsor, Kelly Drive. Our last panel of the day, what tech companies need from telecom partners. We are honored to have Mr. Eric Hanselman, the Chief Analyst of 451 Research, as our moderator. Eric has an extensive, hands-on understanding of a broad range of IT subject areas, having direct experience, of course, in the areas of networks, virtualization, security, and semiconductors. He coordinates industry analysis across the broad portfolio of 451 research disciplines. So please join me welcoming Mr. Eric Hansman. Thank you, Jamie. And I would like to start out introducing uh, our august panelists today. Uh, from my left, David Meredith uh, from CenturyLink, uh, Frank Ray from Microsoft, uh, Felipe Alvarez uh, from uh, Axiom, uh, and Mark Hurley from Schneider. Uh, gentlemen, if you could take a moment to introduce yourselves and your companies. Great, thanks Please. Eric. My name's David Meredith. I run the data center business for CenturyLink. CenturyLink is the third largest network provider after AT&T and Verizon. We're also one of the largest data center providers, so we have what we call hybrid IT solutions, network, co-location, managed services, public and private cloud. We also do consulting, so we're putting together hybrid uh, solutions for our technology cu customers. Yeah, my name is Frank Ray. I work for a small software company in the Pacific Northwest, and I work in the cloud and infrastructure <laughs> division, uh, building out our data center and fiber infrastructure globally. Uh, Felipe Alvarez, uh, CEO of Axiom Fiber Networks. We're a telecom infrastructure provider focused on uh, dark fiber and uh, custom uh, solutions. So we operate, uh, and I say f operate because we do have a fully operational 18-mile fiber network, including five carrier hotels in Manhattan at the moment. Uh, but we're focused on, again, dark fiber and custom solutions. And I'm Mark Harley with Schneider Electric. Uh, Schneider Electric is a manufacturer of infrastructure that goes into uh, data center environments, and I focus uh, with our customers on data center strategy and solutions to meet their business needs. Well, thank you, gentlemen. What the topic we want to address today is what service providers' uh, relationships look like with emerging technology companies and what both technology companies are looking for, what service providers can provide for them, uh, and really what that interplay is of a lot of these next stage companies uh, who in many cases have dreams of changing the model of the world, uh, especially from a, a tech and a, a telecommunications perspective, um, and what those realities are in terms of relationships uh, with, with all of you. So why don't we kick it off uh, with a question of, in terms of those emerging technologies and your experiences with them, uh, what do you see that these early stage tech companies are typically looking from each of you? And uh, David, why don't we start with you? Great, thank you. So we are seeing the rate of change accelerating faster than at any point in the past. So what we talk about a lot now are X as a service providers. So historically, if you look at what the model, say in the software space was, you would build software and then you would sell a big license to an enterprise customer. They would install it on premise and then they would operate that software license. More and more today, the cloudification of all these services is permeating through. Uh, so customers are looking to buy payroll as a service, Salesforce as a service, everything as a service and pay for it by the drink. So with that happening, we're really, our relationship is changing now. Instead of selling our infrastructure to the enterprise all the time, frequently we're actually doing a sell through, sell with type of partnership with the technology company where they're selling their service that's run on our infrastructure because they need to be best in the world at building their specific service out and they, wanna, they don't wanna do the investment and become experts on running the infrastructure. And that's where it's a very good fit. Uh, so we've actually verticalized uh, this X as a service segment where we're going out and doing special solutions that are packaged for them to help them win more business with their customers. Frank, you're seeing similar things at Microsoft. Is that a partnership aspect or are there other pieces to that? Uh, yeah, you know, we work with um, the fine folks at CenturyLink as well as a lot of other providers. 
Now, we're obviously building out a global cloud infrastructure. Uh, we have a lot of challenges that, that come along with that from a scale and scope issue. So, uh, you know, we look to our telecom partners to do what they do best. You know, I don't really have a need to build out a, a team of 2,500 field engineers to go swap out a card in the middle of Fargo, North Dakota, or something like that. So I, you know, I need to deal with billions of customers reaching our services every single day. So we're, we, what we're looking for right now is to have folks understand the challenges that we're facing uh, as a global cloud provider and work with us within their field of expertise to solve those issues, uh, to address what we are trying to accomplish, not necessarily just what's going to drive revenue in their bottom line, per se. Um, we, I think we have a difference between other cloud providers in that we have a lot of products that folks like CenturyLink and others can have a sell to and sell with relationship. Right? We're not there looking to um, you know, launch balloons or, or drones and things like that and become a telco provider and take away that revenue. Rather, we want to figure out how do we make those services stickier for the telco providers uh, and offer more value for their customers. So to do that, we need to make sure that the telco providers are looking at what we're trying to solve and understanding that and trying to pivot their business to help us solve those issues uh, in a way that reaches, reaches the same scale and scope that we're trying to achieve. That makes sense. So Felipe, on your side, from a fiber perspective. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I'm at the bottom of the stack, so <laughs> it makes uh, things a little less uh, uh, complex to a large degree. So uh, what we're seeing is essentially not, nothing, honestly, nothing new in the requirements. It's about being flexible, the speed of delivery, being able to customize a solution, whether it's in terms of the business terms or uh, how something is designed and delivered. Uh, so that's what I call it the basic tenets of being a good service provider. So we're seeing that request come in. I think one of the changes is that, especially in some areas, I mean, you see quite a bit of a pricing pressure because some of these companies, a small software company from the Northwest, I mean, and similar, I mean, they're used to dealing business, doing business on a large scale. Uh, we happen to be a niche provider. Um, but I think that's part of the discussion process is, look, I mean, given where we are, we can do all of this, the, the price point is, typically the, and the delivery time frames are what come into play. Uh, but again, uh, nothing new, honestly, at the fiber level is you had to get it, get it into where we needed to get it. By the time you say you're going to get it into at the price point and then maintain it. Uh, and that's, again, I go back to the core principles of what service providers do, especially at the uh, zero layer, so to speak. Well, I think uh, Felipe and I share the bottom of the totem pole. Um, you know, we're, we're in the business of uh, providing data center solutions to our customers. And what I see in the marketplace is, you know, there's always cost pressures. Everybody is in competition with one another, and everybody's driving for the lowest price. But they also want uh, speed to market. Um, the, uh, the, the development of technology is growing at a faster pace than our infrastructure can support it, and we need to figure out ways to deliver these data center solutions uh, quicker. They're also looking for predictability um, and, and reliability, you know, predictability in, in the cost. When you're deploying data center solutions either in a regional data center or an edge compute facility, you want to be confident that what you're getting in, you know, one state or one country is going to be the same uh, over and over again. And I don't think we're there with predictability. Everybody has their own ideas about what they need in the way of data center infrastructure. Um, the other thing I think is, that's changing is, is I see a move from high reliability data centers to high reliability software applications. Uh, and that is driving down the requirement and the, and the reliance on uh, data center infrastructure to have 100% uptime because of their ability to fail over. And that's helping drive down that infrastructure cost. Well, we can, we can have the whole discussion around does tier two plus tier two equal tier four. Uh, that a whole other topic and probably <laughs> a whole other panel session on that. But, but you bring up some good points about some of those changing demands. Uh, what do you, uh, both Mark and Felipe, you, you guys were talking about 
uh, a lot of those pressures around that triad of quality, cost, speed that's being pushed to you. Uh, what do you see as something that, that you'd like to see from tech companies um, in terms of either input into this process um, or more background or something to help you do your business better? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, what I would like to see is some sort of standardization on the platform because everything is engine or engineered to order custom. Everybody has their own idea of what data center design they need, what resiliency, uh, concurrently maintainable. You see um, people use the terms tier three data center, tier two data center. Well, if you look at a tier three data center, not all tier threes are created alike. Every one of them I look at is different, has a little bit different spin on it. Um, so some, some consistency, you know, if we, could, if we could develop a commoditized data center product that could be delivered that everybody can agree on, then you're going to really drive down the prices and increase the speed to market. Uh, speaking with my Uptime Institute hat on, there are a lot of different ways to skin the tier cat, mm -hmm. a lot of ways to build it. So standardization certainly would be a useful thing. But uh, So uh, Felipe, similar kinds of things in terms of access service? I think I focus on something slightly different, which is I'd like to have a relationship where the, uh, uh, the, the potential buyer, the partner, actually is open about what they're driving at. Sometimes uh, because we're a small part of a to total solution, you get a component of it. Uh, you know, My wish would be that they'd be more open as to what the total solution is, how do we play a role in that, uh, and set realistic expectations on delivery and price points. Uh, I mean, I'm fine walking away from a deal because there's a discipline to say, no, I can't do it by, at that price or I cannot do it at that time frame, and I, and I rather walk away from this deal today and come back into something else tomorrow, basically. Uh, but is that inter, uh, that cooperation between true partners that I think it's, uh, it's not always present? Um, and I go back to, I mean, we're a component very often of a larger solution, and sometimes it does help for us to understand what that larger solution is. So openness to the degree that you can. Uh, being able to see the whole elephant as opposed to he, grasping at individual he, pieces of it. It might help us make decisions in a different way sometimes mm -hmm. or think about some other ways of getting at it, you know, rather than doing it in a complete vacuum of I need this by this date at this price or walk away. Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Frank, uh, similar kinds of things. Do you'd like to reflect back? Uh, I, I know Felipe would like to have a lot more transparency from me at times. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, I think Mark brought up a good point. Uh, you know, certainly all data centers are not created equal. Um, not all applications are created equal. Not all clouds are created equal as well. Uh, you know, Microsoft, we have 200 online properties, and we service consumers to enterprise to government customers, and, and all of them have their own requirements from security, privacy, data uh, sensitivity, et cetera. So government regulations, um, some of the things that we also talked about this morning on the IoT panel. So trying to mesh 200 different online services into a single cloud with you know a multitude of different requirements uh, is certainly you know, certainly somewhat challenging I, you know if we can figure out what that standardization looks like I'd more than welcome to have that discussion you know and it'd be a lot easier for me to deal with my engineers but uh, the I, I think it is true what, what what Felipe said I think there needs to be a little bit more transparency of what's happening. Uh, in the cloud business, but I think that carriers and telco providers need to understand what's happening, you know, take a moment to understand what's happening in the cloud space right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of market share that's being uh, addressed and, and going after. Uh, specifically within Microsoft, you know, we, when I started about three years ago, and we were still an enterprise consumer of telco services, and I say enterprise consumer very specifically because the way we were purchasing services was all very outsourced. The network uh, data centers were not a key part of our supply chain. You know, we were still a box software provider. So uh, you know, we did some math and presented the, the business case to Steve Ballmer, the CEO at the time. And if we had continued to build out our cloud infrastructure the way that Microsoft was doing it when I joined, it would have cost $20 billion a year, which basically would have been, meant bankruptcy for Microsoft. We certainly would not have been able to compete with Amazon or anybody else. So taking the path from enterprise consumer to investor, you know, it's a little bit difficult to just try to tell everybody what you're doing and expect them to be on the up and up, you know. Uh, so there's that aspect of it. So trying to understand what the cloud providers are, are up against amongst themselves 
I think that would, I would like to see the telco players take as much time to understand that part of the business as much as they try to figure out exactly what they're doing so they could build something to come and sell it to me. And I think that would be forge a, a closer partnership between the players. So David, from your side, what would you like to see? We see the relationships fundamentally changing right now. So we're really looking at building communities or ecosystems where we sit in the middle of many to many relationships. So on the network side, even though we're the third largest network, we're proactively going out and we're creating network diversity. So on average, some of our data centers have more than 20 network providers. On average, we have seven network providers into all of our data centers. On the cloud and services side, we're trying to bring in lots of different providers as well. So we have over 20,000 enterprise customers. We want to build communities and ecosystems where someone can be just a cross-connect away from whatever solution is that they want to get. And when you're talking about being in a community, there are uh, responsibilities and obligations you have to that community. So it is a fundamental change in, in how we all relate to each other, and we think it provides a lot of benefits for everybody in that ecosystem. Well, as we start building out greater dependencies upon our ecosystem partners, that winds up being much more critical in terms of all those interconnections. Uh, when we think about what those interconnections look like, uh, there's still an awful lot of effect about what's local versus global reach. Uh, we start thinking about issues around data sovereignty, issues about locality. I mean, in theory, we live in a world in which location should be unimportant, right? But that's still a reality that local connectivity is, is still a big deal. Placement is important, um, and especially when you start dealing with data issues. Um, Frank, is that something from a, a Microsoft perspective? I mean, you've got an infrastructure that spans the globe. Um, how do you start to balance those concerns around what's local, I mean, global reach, and, and really starting to, to balance some of what is that, that larger set of questions about how you interact with a, a set of providers? Yeah, I guess anybody that said that, that um, localization is not an issue has never tried to get a cross-connect at Rockefeller Center, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the Hudson River. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I think we talked about this a, a little bit this morning as well. Um, part of what everybody is trying to solve, I think, is, is, is part of what creates most of the intricacies and difficulties and challenges within the telecommunications industry in that um, you know the way you do something in Paris is completely different the way you do it in Marseille and you haven't even left France yet so um, just to use an example all of the way that things happen locally similar to the standardization with the data center all of these little intricacies make up what the global internet is um, and it's exactly that which kind of makes it work and what drives the engine forward in trying to drive innovation and finding new ways to do things so on the one hand yes i want to standardize part of my job uh, is to find where all the toll booths are in the internet and try to get rid of as many as i can for Microsoft, uh, and but yet on the other side, I don't want to see that kind of localization go away because uh, otherwise we lose a little bit of the entrepreneurial spirit that will find uh, those inefficiencies within the market and within the technology to be able to drive us forward. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, and sometimes I think you have to be careful what you wish for. Drones and balloons will fill in all the gaps, right? Oh, <laughs> and all the sensors. <laughs> Well, but I, I think there's an opportunity there, and there are companies. There are companies out there that are popping up that are called the buffer companies. These are companies that act as a, an insulator, <laughs> in a way, that you can deal with, uh, uh, and that absorb some of the locality variances, right? Uh, that can provide services, you know, and make it transparent to a buyer like a Microsoft, let's say, you know, as to all of the, the, the everything else that's happening behind that, right? Because they're dealing with all the issues and all that, and smoothing out the variances. Uh, and there's a few out there that are coming up that I think are of uh, interest, so it's a market opportunity uh, for that kind of Potential in that. service, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. David, similar thoughts about the balance between local and global? Yeah, our, cu our customers really drive where we go with, with our solutions. So we have several of the Fortune 500 as customers today. We're in Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong. We just recently launched in mainland China solutions. Uh, we're in Europe, uh, and we've also had our customers come and say, look, we need global coverage 
we like the fact that we can do one master services agreement with you and you manage and just take all the complexity out. We call it the big staples easy button. We just make it really easy for them. So we've actually connected our 57 data centers to 230 other data centers around the world. So we can essentially provide a seamless set of services globally. That was all driven by customer demand, very specific needs customers had. Um, when you look at some of the big underlying trends that are driving Internet of Things, uh, big data, these are creating a need to have a global footprint for some of the bigger customers. And is that something that you see any variation between the Fortune 500 and early stage tech companies um, or similar kinds of requirements? Yeah, the born in the cloud companies are really interesting. And so we like to work with them as well. And we're seeing a real boom in business in the Bay Area right now. Uh, we have about a half a dozen data centers there. So um, they don't know where they're going to have success. So when they set up shop, they have some ideas. They have a business plan. Usually it shows up and to the right or for their investors. Uh, but, but they don't really know where they're going to get traction. So one of the things we've introduced is a concept we call flex spend, which essentially says sign up with us. And if you need to move your workloads around our footprint globally, we're going to take the friction out of that for you. So you're not locked into a geography. And if you start to get traction in a particular industry vertical or geography, we can support that in a way for you. And they seem to have responded well to that. So Mark, um, on the data center side, do you see demand that varies between what those local requirements are um, and that aspect of global reach? Or is that something you're primarily dealing on the facilities side? Yeah. Or? Schneider is a global company, but um, as Frank alluded to, uh, there's different requirements. With whatever country you go to, they have different codes uh, around ele electrical codes. They have different permitting requirements, and it creates a challenge. Now, Fortunately, we're, we're a company that has offices throughout the globe that are focused and, can, and, and solve those particular business problems in that location, but it, it, there's no standardization across the globe. That's it's like, that's if I can sure. paraphrase a politician from up my way, all data centers are local. <laughs> <laughs> Something along those lines. You know, I think it's, it's in interesting what David said, and the folks like CenturyLink and others, they're doing a really good job in in trying to create some form of ubiquity for their end users, but I think what that really masks is the complexity and the localization and the, the differentiation that happens uh, at the actual service level uh, across the board. So while you may sign one contract with CenturyLink, you don't see the multitude of contracts that they need to sign to be able to service you in China or Malaysia or South America or wherever. So you know that's, I think, part of the opportunity that, that, that Felipe was alluding to. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I mean, the, the more I listen to this, it seems like uh, going back to the one big telco in the sky is probably the best <laughs> option, right? I mean, well, that's what the drones are for, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I want to make sure also we're going to have uh, that we have time for audience questions uh, before we run out our time. And we're standing between all of you and Bellinis. Uh, and so keep your thinking caps on. If you have questions for any of our panelists, by all means, we want to make sure we have time to take them. Uh, if we think about what telecom operators are, are doing to address some of the misalignments uh, in timelines for infrastructure development. You know, we're in a day and an age where it's now, 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 and we whip out the credit card and generate cloud capabilities. Um, we're certainly not there, and I, we can certainly raise the question whether or not we should be there in terms of the, the operator side of things. Um, what do you think about being able to deal with some of these issues? Felipe, you'd mentioned uh, you know, one of the challenges of ensuring that you're delivering on time uh, within requirements, but we're seeing a lot of that, I know, from anecdotally from our client base. There's a lot of got to have it now. How do we actually work around what are procurement times that that made sense historically um, and have a lot of practical issues that, that prevent them from moving much more quickly. I, uh, you know, my comment about these buffer companies and companies that kind of help absorb that kind of shock, essentially, uh, uh, is, is very valid because the reality is I deal with a very small microcosm right now. This is just south of 59th Street. Uh, and the amount of, uh, it's not dissimilar to the global environment because you're dealing with landlords in New York City, the city of New York, uh, the, the conduit system, uh, 10,000 things that people don't realize are required just to deliver fiber two blocks <laughs> to a carry hotel, right? So it's, it's just a very small microcosm of a, the larger global issue. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not very uh, positive on the outlook that we as an industry can actually inter smooth out uh, all of that on our own. 
Uh, I think uh, companies will drive us there. The, the, what are called the emerging, uh, and I hate to say telecom companies, but the emerging companies that are essentially becoming uh, the, the new uh, telecom service providers. And you know, I have one sitting next to me here, even though I'm sure they'll they'll, they'll deny that. But I look at them. This is the future. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the future. Essentially, they're taking things into their own hands because we, as an industry, can't. Uh, so to, for us to do it on our own uh, is going to be difficult because we have we're competitors. Uh, you know, we're vying for the business. I mean, we're pricing, you know, we have investor issues. We have, to, we have the same, a lot of issues. Uh, so I go back to there's a market opportunity for companies that are going to absorb that hit and pass it and not pass it on to the customer. Either, I'm happy to do it in whichever, whichever order if you're chomping at the no, bit there. No, no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, the, it's true. I mean, Mark, Mark said it uh, before. A lot of the cloud providers, content providers, uh, new tech companies, as they're being called now, you know, we have all of this localization, we have all this differentiation, and we're looking for more predictability within our supply chain. Uh, over the last 10 years, the timelines to build out large-scale infrastructure projects is getting longer and longer, uh, if they even happen at all, while product development cycles and time to market in today's digital economy continues to get faster and faster. Uh, you know, we, uh, as cloud provider with Microsoft, we live in a world where if a customer doesn't like us, they can move all of their services away in a matter of two clicks, and I probably will never get them back. Uh, and on the flip side, on a positive note, they may come to me and say, hey, I'm looking, I have eight data centers today, I'm not a data center provider, I'm a, you know, natural gas provider, I want to move all of my workloads uh, as a test into one of, you know, take one of my data centers and move those workloads into, onto your cloud. And uh, two months later, they say, that happened so great. I'm going to close all of my other data centers down and move all of my workloads over to you, and I'm going to do it in three months. Can you do that? Right? And all of a sudden now, we have to be able to move as quickly as possible within a matter of clicks, because otherwise, if we can't do it, they will be gone. So trying to do that while dealing with regulatory environments, permitting environments, whether or not somebody is able to get funding from a, a VC or a bank or anything like that, you know, these are things that that are extremely disruptive to, to my supply chain. And that's something that you can call it taking matters into your own hands. You can call it whatever I try to call it, bringing more predictability to the scale and scope of how our, our services run for our customers and their mission critical data. Yeah, I think Frank referenced earlier how we work really hard to make it easy for our customers. And I always think of the synchronized swimming. If everything above the water is so graceful and flowing and beautiful and effortless, and you don't see all the legs churning underneath the water when you're watching that particular sport. So um, it is a big issue. And at the end of the day, a uh, customer says, I want to move all my data centers in three months, and that's a ton of work you have to do. But you've got to be able to meet their need if you can. So we've done several things to try to help. One thing around innovation is we've actually launched modular data centers. So we're working with a, a great partner named Baselayer out of Phoenix. And we have deployed uh, multiple megawatts of modular data centers. So it used to be we're going to build anywhere from 1 to 10 megawatts in a phase. Now we can drop in at 200 kilowatts. And we can drop in modular. So it's more capital efficient. We can get it to market faster. And it has other benefits as well for our customers. Uh, we also do pre-configured bundles. So we have a connected colo bundle, network plus co-location. We do something called Fast Track, where we guarantee to have a customer up and running within seven days. And the only way you can do that is you've got to basically put some bets down in advance and know really where the demand's going to come from and have the solutions ready to go. Um, but we've been pretty good about staying ahead of that. And it really comes down to having a close relationship with your end customer so you know where their demand is going to be and you can try to stay at least a day ahead of that. Mark, you're actually on yeah. the delivery end of that yeah. equation. Yeah, just to kind of tag on to what David said, um, you know, you can build modularly and scalable in a traditional fashion, or you can do it with a prefabricated solution. But um, I think not all data centers are created equal, and the needs aren't equal a across the industry. But for your particular purpose, if you can identify what your, your base need is and standardize on that design, you can get a prefabricated solution or a stick-built, modular, scalable solution already pre-planned. You know how it's going to lay out 200 kW increments, 500 kW, whatever, whatever your particular business seat is, and then you can deliver it more cost-effective and, and uh, 
uh, with a greater speed to market. You know, my previous uh, career, I worked for a large financial institution, built a lot of data centers with them. Every one of them was custom, unique, re-engineered from the ground up, um, and it just wastes a lot of time and money. You know, in, in my, uh, where I live in North Carolina, you see a school being built. Well, they use the same engineered design to build the next school that's coming up, the next middle school or the next high school, and that's where you can gain efficiencies. Sounds good. Well, I want to make sure we've got time for questions from the audience. So anyone with questions for our panel today? We have right here. I wanted to ask you about security. Security has been a, a big issue at a lot of the trade shows recently. A lot of the, the press obviously likes to talk about security. Um, there have been discussions that maybe security will be something that's not no longer handled by customers, they'll be handled by service providers, or even by people like Microsoft or Amazon providing that as a service on top of a carrier. What's your opinion on where security is going to be as it becomes more important? We definitely have more and more customers coming to us asking for help with security. For one thing, it gives them a little bit of protection to say, hey, we hired somebody else to do this in case something you know, there, there is an incident, so they like to have that. Uh, we, what we've done is we've set up managed services within our data center footprint where essentially any of our customers are just a cross-connect away from a managed firewall solution, uh, DDoS protection, all sorts of virtual security in addition to the physical envelope of the security that we provide around the data center. We're not uh, a product company when it comes to, to security, so we're really looking to provide a service. So we're working with different uh, product companies out there, uh, to, Fortinet is one that we think very highly of, uh, where we can take Fortinet solutions and run that as a managed service for our customers. And we see a ton of demand for that, and we expect to see that growing quite a bit going forward. Other questions? All right, well, with that, I want to head into a closing question for all of us. Uh, the environments in which we're operating are rapidly changing. That's been just the, you know, one of the basic facts of technology. Uh, what do each of you see as opportunities uh, in the time ahead in terms of being able to, to work in the tech space uh, and engaging with companies and the kind of capabilities that you can provide? So Mark, when you start you from the end. Opportunities. Well, in infrastructure, you know, people are looking for um, uh, low cost, they're looking for energy efficient, total cost of operation. Well, one of the areas I see is um, with regards to UPS systems that are backing up your hardware, uh, I think there's an over-specification on battery runtime for, for backup purposes. Uh, if people would be willing to adopt shorter uh, battery runtime, you could save a significant cost in your UPS. I mean, your generators are going to fire up in in 30 seconds or less and transfer the load. So why expect 15 minutes worth of battery backup? Or in some telcos, you know, the old, you know, DC power plants, it's eight hours uh, of backup. But, you know, why spend that money to back up something that should transfer in 30 seconds? And the reality is, is can you really get a generator plant online if it fails to come online in that 15 minutes? That's a hit or miss question. You just you just scared me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is all about building more tier two data centers, yeah, right? Apparently. The software solves all those problems, <laughs> right? Right. That's right. <laughs> software resiliency, application resiliency is what we need. Software Who needs batteries? Find anything. <laughs> Felipe, similar kinds of things in terms of uh, fiber provisioning. Uh, well, look, fiber is a very simple business, right? I mean, there's not there's not a lot of uh, nuances to uh, to what we do and what you do with fiber. I mean, I uh, I think opportunity-wise, uh, there's always an opportunity to continue to build the fiber network out. Eventually, there'll be enough connectivity, certainly, uh, never mind the U.S. across the world, that you'll be able to actually move your data centers quicker. You know, shift the data, and it's not even move the data centers; you just shift the, the data processing loads and and. and uh, the, the, what Frank was alluding to, which is someone can shift, you know, a complete data center uh, processing processing terms anyway, overnight, right? So we'll get to that point. We're not there yet. In some areas, we are. You know, we can figure out exactly how do we compete against each other without, you know, killing the customer essentially. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I go back to opportunity-wise, and I may go and start my company called Philco, the uh, the buffer company. I mean, which kind of mm -hmm. takes in all of this variances and nuances and CenturyLink and Axiom and Zeo and everybody else and we kind of say, listen guys, I mean, we're going to do this 
and then Frank can go to that company and say, I'll buy from you because I know you'll take care of all of this stuff and I don't have to worry about it, right? There'll be a risk and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think that's sort of like what comes out of this whole discussion because, again, as an industry, we're not going to make it easier for the buyer, honestly. We've been trying for how many, for 30 years, as long as I've been in the industry, and it's not getting any easier. Is that a matter for higher level standards? Something on that I, order? I don't think it's a standard issue. So as long as you have different companies interacting with one another and different investor sets and different uh, egos involved, you're not going to see it. And, and that's the job <laughs> of differentiation that Frank was mentioning. So you're, you're trying yes. to extract value and or and differentiate in each of those environments? That's standards grind that down? Yeah, the standards is, you know, I think the real, at the end of the day, the standards are the laws of physics. You know, that's what it's going to, you know, everything else is, uh, as Felipe said, you have nationalities and egos and uh, regulatory bodies and politicians involved. So it's going to be very difficult to find certain standards. Um, but I think where we're going to see a lot of um, change and impact, aside from the pesky laws of physics, uh, you know, a lot of the virtualization in the, in the networking space uh, as well, um, in addition to what we're seeing, for example, in the industrial internet of things, where I think that's really going to stress certain business models in the telecommunications space from a billing perspective, provisioning perspective, and operations perspective. And that coupled together with uh, data analytics uh, and data visualization is going to allow us to drive a lot of uh, efficiencies from an operational side and a business side across all kinds of different industries. So I think we're going to see in that space a, a new type of industrial revolution that's really going to allow us to to change the way that we work. Not and it's not, you know, not just my refrigerator telling me if I'm out of milk. You know, it's about the the plane uh, sending a note to the airport that it needs a maintenance while it's still two hours in, in route. Driven by a lot of data. I was having a conversation earlier today about data in agriculture of all right. things. Anybody know how Connected much? Connected cows. Well, uh, does anybody know how much data a cow actually generates? Turns out it's not very much, but there are a lot of them. <laughs> but dealing with that and the opportunities that, that creates. Yeah. Uh, similar kinds of ideas? It's a really exciting time. This move to the cloud, it's really the gold rush of our generation. And we're still early days on this. So if you look at maybe 15% of all enterprise servers are in third party data centers. I think probably, I think 451 says what, about 26% of all workloads are either cloud or third party data center. So there's still a lot of workloads to move over. And where we're positioned is really, we're sell we don't know who's gonna win. There's gonna be big winners, big losers in the cloud space, but we're gonna be there selling Flint, Tinder, rope, mules, whatever, whatever infrastructure gear they need, and we need to be best in the world at that, and we need to innovate on that. So um, to the point that Mark was talking about, we're really looking to innovate and drive cost lower for our customers. So we're the first ever multi-tenant data center provider to power a data center with Bloom fuel cells. We have recently launched a data center in the Pacific Northwest, uh, almost 100% hydroelectric powered. So the cost per kilowatt hour is 2.8 cents. If you look around the North America, you're typically going to see on average north of nine cents per kilowatt hour. So we're able to pass those types of savings and those renewable green benefits onto our end customers. So we're trying to innovate in the space that we can to make it better, better for them going forward. Sounds good. Well, with that, we will wrap it up. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, and will you join me in thanking our panelists? Thank you. Thank you very much.